Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to uh, Squaw Valley, California. Uh, did everybody get up here OK? Any travel issues at all? <laughs> Wasn't as bad as last year. Uh, we have a special uh, announcement at the end of the event about next year's uh, location, which will be in a much more difficult place to get to. Uh, also, tonight's evening reception, don't forget to enjoy a mudslide. Uh, we're going to be having those available for everyone. <laughs> Too soon? Too soon? All right. Uh, well, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you also for spending your Valentine's Day uh, with us. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> As does mine. Uh, so, but uh, one of the things that uh, we, we want to, you know, a, a, as these, this event evolves, uh, and next year we'll try not to put it on Valentine's Day, but we do want to encourage people to bring their uh, family along. Um, I don't know if everyone was aware of this. I hope at least most of you were. We have free childcare at uh, the event this week. We have lots and lots of uh, parents who bought their children. Uh, this week uh, to the event, including mine. You may see my uh, eight-year-old daughter running around, uh, but we, we really want to make this an event where people can come and enjoy themselves. Uh, and the most important thing we want to get out of this event, hopefully for all of you, is that all of you will build better relationships with each other. And to that end, what I'd really encourage you to do this week is to get to know people who you don't know already this week. We really, th this year's crowd is incredibly special. Like we have an amazing group of people from all aspects of open source. Uh, you people who are leading open source program office, people who are uh, running and uh, managing some of the biggest open source projects in the world, uh, folks who are deploying open source uh, to billions and billions of subscribers in the telecom space, people who are using open source to create production automobiles. It's just. All walks of open source are at this event this week. And what we've done is structured our time so that there's lots of opportunity to network, to get to know each other. We've emphasized the hallway track. Uh, and I hope that all of you will take advantage of the, that opportunity. I do want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, uh, including Intel, VMware, Dell EMC, and IBM. Uh, let's give them a quick round of applause. Uh, as I mentioned, we're having a reception tonight at 5.30 in the ballroom foyer. Uh, again, mud slides will be available in addition to beer and wine. Uh, and then tomorrow night, we're going to have themed receptions throughout the hotel. This will be an opportunity for people to go to sort of different thematic uh, network get-togethers and really, again, get to know each other so that we can all do good work together in the future. Um, and then we also have an open space for unconference sessions. So if you have a topic you'd like to discuss, uh, the sign-up board is in the foyer, so just go ahead and find the uh, unconference uh, session sign-up, uh, and uh, people will be able to do that uh, as well. And so, again, I want to thank all of you for coming, uh, and then give you a little update on where the Linux Foundation is at this year. Uh, this is our annual member event, uh, and you know, we're really happy to have all of you here. This year we have over 400 uh, people just at this event. Uh, this past year has been a good year for the Linux Foundation, and 2017 is already shaping up to be a really good year. You know, one of the things that we're really focused on is having a big impact on uh, creating the greatest shared technology investment in the world. And it's not just us. You know, our mission really is to create the largest shared technology investment in the world by making open source code available for anyone to use. But I want to emphasize, it's not just the Linux Foundation. Uh, there are other foundations. Um, is Mike Malinkovich around here somewhere from the Eclipse? Right there, Mike Malinkovich from the Eclipse Foundation in the back of the room there. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> His organization, like ours, is again dedicated to the same thing. We want to make a lot of source code available to uh, as many people as possible. And on the Linux Foundation's end, uh, to that end, we've had a massive increase in the number of organizations and people that we work with. Uh, I think the 827 member companies in the Linux Foundation is already out of date. Uh, I think Mike Wooster is around here somewhere. Uh, we, we, it's about 50 out of date, so uh, we're going we're gonna to probably break 1,000 organizations participating in the Linux Foundation this year, uh, which is a big milestone. I, the, the thing I'm most proud about that is the fact that 
companies that are coming in now from wholesale new sectors that hadn't done a lot of open source uh, work in the past, telecom, automotive, et cetera, are really learning how to do shared software development, understanding the intellectual property regimes that open source represents, and just sort of greasing the skids for broader flow of code, which is incredibly important if your mission is to create the greatest shared technology resource in the world. Uh, last year, we had over 20,000 attendees at 150 events from 85 different countries. Uh, it, it's, uh, it is crazy. Uh, where is Angela and her team? Around here somewhere. Let's give them a quick round of applause. <clears throat> well, we're gonna add another 50 events this year. Where is Angela? Is Angela screaming right now? We're not. Actually, we're gonna try and reduce the number of events, so we're combining some of our events, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Uh, one thing you might not know about the Linux Foundation is we do a lot of training. We've trained over 800,000 students, most of whom uh, take our training courses at no cost. Uh, we are trying to make sure that the projects that we work with have a set of practitioners and developers that can further increase the adoption of that particular code. Not only that, we have training programs that are trying to help uh, the diversity in our communities, both in terms of gender. We offer free training scholarships for uh, women's organizations uh, all over the world. We've also partnered with the Goodwill in Austin, Texas, where we're working with people in poverty to give them job skills, technical skills through our training curriculum and through a hands-on mentor program to lift those folks out of poverty, single parents, folks who've seen hard times, folks who need good jobs. Uh, and those are just a few of the things we're doing around training. We're creating at the Linux Foundation, uh, we did a little tally across all the projects that just we're hosting, about $14 billion worth of value. If you measure up the lines of code and how much it costs on average to create a line of code, it's billions and billions of dollars worth of value. And certainly Linux itself just continues to dominate almost every aspect of modern computing. Uh, it, it runs almost all high-performance computing systems, uh, the majority of mobile devices, embedded systems, uh, most of the world's economy, the internet, it's safe to say, runs on Linux. So we're gonna continue, and we hope all of you join us, and we know you're already working with us, to really focus on those big outcomes. How can we really move the needle with shared open source software to really make big impact on both industry and society? And you know, one of the things that I get asked about all the time is, you know, you're doing so much more than Linux, when are you gonna change the name of the Linux Foundation? And my response to that is, I just made up like all these vests and gave them away to everyone. <laughs> We're not changing the name, <laughs> at least not for now. Uh, but no, no name change, but we really have gone beyond Linux. Uh, some of you may be aware, but many of you might not be aware that we do a lot of work around security. You're gonna hear from Bruce Schneier in a minute here about uh, a world that uh, is facing increasing uh, difficulty and trouble when it comes to cybersecurity, privacy, and other things. We have an initiative uh, that we're working with here called Let's Encrypt. Is there anyone here from the Let's Encrypt project? A few people? Or some folks? Let's Encrypt is a free certificate authority. The idea behind Let, Let's Encrypt is to make HTTPS the default for the internet, to secure all internet traffic by creating a free certificate authority. This, in 2016, for the first time ever, more than 50% of internet traffic was secure, in large part thanks to Let's Encrypt. We can literally chart where Let's Encrypt started to when the, move, the needle started moving up in terms of secure traffic across the internet, and we want to get that as high as we possibly can. Our core infrastructure initiative is working with projects that are sort of the intersection between incredibly important to the security and integrity of the global internet and kind of screwed up. It's screwed up in terms of difficulty getting funding, have a requirement for a third party audit, need additional eyeballs on the code, uh, things like OpenSSL, uh, NTPD, uh, other projects. Uh, where really that initiative is about creating a culture of secure coding practices for all open source projects 
and helping fix open source projects that haven't traditionally gotten resources but are important to society by providing them funding and other resources as well. If you haven't seen the Core Infrastructure Initiative badging program, which has been adopted by some of the biggest open source projects in the world, check it out. This is a way for your project to indicate that you follow secure coding practices, have responsible disclosure policy, uh, have a more efficient way of making sure that security is part and parcel to everything you do in coding. In the networking sector, we have lots of new open source projects and that's only getting bigger. We're working with the largest uh, global operators in the world. You're gonna hear this week from organizations like AT&T. Uh, last year, we partnered with China Mobile to announce uh, a management and orchestration platform. They're essentially open sourcing the network infrastructure that provides service to billions of uh, people all over the world. Uh, we're doing a lot of good work to harmonize those projects. You're gonna hear about that throughout this week. In the cloud, our Cloud Native Computing Foundation with uh, projects such as uh, Kubernetes, Prometheus, and others is really leading the way in terms of the modern microservice and container-based application development uh, methodology that, that really is defining the way people build apps today. Cloud Foundry, another example of a platform that's being used to create incredibly important uh, technology solutions for governments and organizations throughout the world. Our Automotive Linux initiative, is Dan Couchy in the room? Maybe not, I did see him at the bar late last night. <laughs> this is, is such a sleeper project at the Linux Foundation that's going to have a huge impact just as more and more production vehicles roll out with the AGL code in it. This, uh, at CES this year, Daimler announced that they're joining our automotive grade Linux initiative. So now we have Toyota, Daimler, and a dozen of the world's biggest automotive OEMs all working together to create the future automotive middleware and informatic systems that will really define what an automotive cockpit experience looks like. And then finally, uh, last year in December, I think pretty much there, no, we, we, we rolled it out this year. I started working on December. Uh, this month, I think, is the one year anniversary of our blockchain initiative, Hyperledger. Uh, Brian Bellendorf will be here this week to talk about it. He uh, runs that particular initiative at the Linux Foundation. You're gonna hear from Chris Ferris uh, from IBM about blockchain. But distributed ledger technology is no doubt changing the way that people uh, are creating trust transactions on the internet. Think of this as sort of the new trust protocol for the internet. Hyperledger's technologies are being deployed in financial service applications that are really modernizing the financial service back office. You know, it takes a nanosecond to make a trade with high frequency trading systems, and it takes a week or two to reconcile that trade on the back office. All that's going to be changed as large organizations start using distributed ledger technology to manage that back office where clearing a trade will take seconds, minutes, instead of days and weeks. And blockchain technology isn't just about financial services. You're gonna hear about how the Hyperledger project is helping to uh, work with organizations like De Beers to track in an immutable way the provenance of diamonds in order to get blood diamonds out of the system working with governments to create immutable, transparent land registration systems to prevent corruption in those governments and to create a better society. So as you can see, the Linux Foundation is working on a much, and these are, I, I haven't mentioned all of our projects, and to those who I haven't mentioned, I apologize, but I can only do so much in a short period of time, but we're working on a lot more than Linux. So the question that sh this group should ask, the leadership in, in open source and many of our projects is, why do we need open source foundations? Why do we need the Linux Foundation? Mike, I won't speak for you, but uh, it's a good question. And you know, <clears throat> this is something that uh, in today's political world has also uh, uh, come to er uh, light. And uh, recently uh, we, and this, this sort of makes sense, we've seen a flurry of executive orders. And uh, the, the question in, came up in DC as well. I'll give you a second to read the order. Yeah. Too soon? <laughs> so, like we're in California, it's an open source event. I figured this is 
pretty safe crowd. By the way, uh, this order I'm not sure about, but there was another order related to the Linux kernel, uh, where for every, which is bloated and sad, and for every line of code added to the kernel, two lines of code must be removed. <laughs> that one actually makes a lot more sense to me. But, um, you know, it, it's a good question. Why do you need uh, foundations? You know, there are millions of open source projects out there. I think this number is also out of date. How, what's the latest? Is anyone here from GitHub? What's the latest GitHub repo number? F is it 51 million? Is that right? Holy, I got to... <laughs> Man, this is really, I didn't make this very long ago. That, that is incredible. 51 million open source repositories on GitHub. Uh, SourceForge, you know, almost around a half a, a billion. Uh, we've got the ASF with over 175 projects, 300 uh, in, in uh, another, uh, managing around 300 in another 15 incubation. Mike, I, I hope I'm doing you service here. About 163 projects, is that? Roundabout. Three, oh my God, look at this, my numbers are terribly wrong. My apologies. Um, the po no problem, no problem. The point is there's a lot of open source projects out there. The real question is, which ones matter? Which ones matter? You know, I mean, does, do the, 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 the remaining 30 million projects out there that somebody put up for good reasons, you know, maybe they were working on a PhD thesis or it was an undergrad who was working on some experiment. The question I think to all of you, to those who are in the profession of open source, of commercializing and of taking meaningful dependency upon it, right? You know, in the case of some of the blockchain initiatives where we're working with governments to take a societal dependency upon an open source project, you really have to understand which matter. Where is that value related to the number of projects? And, and that's where we think that we want, we think foundations should focus. Helping projects create sustainable ecosystems. These are the ones that end up mattering. And they kind of grow up and to the left in that, if you look at this chart, you know, if you think of what foundations are trying to do, we're trying to kind of grow up and to the left in this slide. This one got reversed. I always like the up and to the left because up and to the right is just too Silicon Valley, you know. Uh, but the best projects, the projects that are meaningful and you can count on for decades to come are those who have a good developer community solving a really big problem where that code is used to create real value. Value in the form of profit for companies. Many of the companies that uh, you work for take open source code, create products and services, and create real profit. That then is in turn reinvested back into the project. And when I say reinvested back into the project, I don't mean reinvested back into a foundation. The foundations, and Mike, you're gonna have to back me up on this, are like a tiny little sliver of the economic activity in an open source project. The real cost is the developers who actually work on these projects. That's where all the major cost is driven in any open source project. It's easy to sign up for a foundation membership. It's much harder to assign three, four very expensive specialized engineers that you've taken a lot of time to train to go work on an open source project collaboratively with companies that uh, may be your competitors. But that's what ends up happening in the best open source projects. And we think that foundations, that the job of a foundation is to create that sustainable ecosystem. It's to work with projects that solve a meaningful problem in society, in the market, to create really good communities. Communities that have a diversity of committers, both in terms of organizations who are committing to the project, in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of class, in terms of quality. If there's no good code, you don't get to the second step here. But then having those very effective communities be used to create really interesting things. Do you know what the production timeline for a automotive, for a car is? It's three years. When Toyota takes a bet on automotive grade Linux, they enter a three year production cycle with their vehicles. I mean, they're iterating the software throughout that period but it's a big long-term commitment. If the code's not good, if they don't think the ecosystem is sustainable, if they don't think the project will be here, they're not gonna make that investment. 
right? And that will create value. And profit may not be the perfect word here. I think value, because it's not always about profit. I think that, you know, if you ask the government of Georgia, the country of Georgia, uh, who's using open source technology for their land registration systems, who's really rooting out a lot of corruption in that country, it's not about profit. It's about making a better society for their people. But they then, in turn, reinvest back in that project that that society is dependent upon by sending engineers, by sending requirements, by sending bug fixes, and so forth. Lather, rinse, repeat. If you ask anybody who works at the Linux Foundation what their job is, this is it. If any of them tell you anything differently when you ask them, give me their names. <laughs> yeah. um, but this is what all our projects are looking for. So, you know, people ask me, like, well, I'm not, why are you doing this project? Why are you doing that project? That's why. It's to create these sustainable ecosystems, right? And we know what happens when projects fall out of that, that feedback loop. Look at OpenSSL. I mean, the internet was secured by two guys named Steve. NTPD, you know, Harlan Sten on his own is keeping time on the internet with a 30-year-old code base written in C that still in BitKeeper and is very hard to commit to. That sustainability loop is going to be more and more important as open source becomes more and more important to all your companies, to all of society, uh, and to all of us as individuals. And ecosystems take real work. This is what foundations do. This is the details. This is what Mike's team, what my team do day in and day out. We create a governance structure where you can pool intellectual property for long-term safe harbor. You have a development process, right? Making sure that individual developers are the ones that are making the decisions as opposed to companies trying to mandate them. You know, this is, that pay to, this is the pay to play myth, right? All our projects have individual technical steering committees where their role on those technical steering committees go with the person. When Open Daylight started, one of our early uh, projects, the lead committer for the, the, on the TSC for that project was a Cisco employee who had written a lot of the code base at Cisco. Two months into the project, quit Cisco, went to Red Hat, didn't lose his position on the technical steering committee. See, this creates some sustainable marketplace as well, where your organizations are competing on the market for these developers who are in these important positions. And that just makes the project stronger. That's, a, that's, that's not a bug, that's a feature. That's critically important to the success of these projects, right? And it also just so happens to improve the pay of individual developers who work on these projects, who are committed to them, and who get in these important roles. We provide the infrastructure for projects whether it's making sure that we have a way to do a developer certificate of origin with a GitHub project, or whether it's a custom infrastructure for brownfield networking deployments that need God knows what kind of hardware to uh, test all this stuff. Where's Ed Warnicky? God knows what kind of hardware you people need to test your project. Uh, you also need ecosystem development, events like this, ways where people can get together and solve problems. I think it's going to become more important to have these kind of get-togethers in a structured way across projects, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. We also think that you need intellectual property management, tracking the code, making sure that trademarks are owned in a neutral place, making sure that everyone understands that there's a safe harbor. Uh, whether it's trademarks, whether it's copyright, whether it's patent regimes, we're creating structures to create this neutral playing field. Because open source projects don't exist in isolation. We can do more. The important thing now is that none of this stuff works without the other stuff. And this is just a sampling. It's sort of almost a random, and you can argue with the categories and what is up there. But what really matters is how do we work across these projects from a security point of view, having good, secure coding practices. From a governance point of view, how do you make sure you raise up the individual developer? Don't break what is great about open source but help underwrite that development so it's sustainable. Make sure that the copyright regimes, the trademark regimes, the patent regimes are stable, transparent, and advocate for sharing and not for uh, walls. Sorry, subtle wall joke, I just couldn't resist a second shot. Um, and then provide training and, and, and uh, certification programs to get more practitioners. This is going to be critical because as you go up and down the stack, we're changing nouns to verbs. Meaning that in networking, as one example, you have a management orchestration component, an SDN controller, 
you have data plane services, you have all these different pieces that make up a networking stack. But those are nouns. What you really need is, here's how I onboard a VNF, how I orchestrate something. And that's gonna cro uh, need cross-project cooperation, common configuration languages, common data modeling, things that we all need to work together, not just inside of our projects, but across projects. And that's what we really wanna get done at the Linux Foundation. And finally, we think that diverse communities across all of these organizations are strong communities. This year, the Linux Foundation is going to provide hundreds of scholarships for women and people in, from underrepresented communities to come to all of our events, free training programs for them. Today, we announced with the National Center for Women in Technology a training program, an e-learning program for all the speakers at our events, where you can sit down, and I've taken this, spend yeah, about an hour or so, learning how to better communicate with people who are different from you. And you're gonna see, take this class. We'll even give you a special t-shirt and some swag for taking it. I'm looking at you right there. No, but take it. Because one of the things that you'll learn is that there is a massive amount of scientific evidence that shows how diverse communities perform better than those that are not. How if you take a little bit of time to learn how to stop interrupting people, to be a better person, that you'll get better outcomes. We're really committed to that at the Linux Foundation. So that's the update. We're working on a ton of different interesting projects. We're working both within our projects and outside of our projects to create a greater shared technology investment, which is our ultimate goal. And I wanna give one final thank you uh, to, uh, and, and I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit over here uh, to give this special thank you. Uh, you know, uh, the, the final thing I'd like to share today uh, is thank you to someone who's been working at the Linux Foundation. And you know, one of my proudest moments when at the Linux Foundation uh, is not when someone new comes to, to work uh, at the Linux Foundation, although I will say I was pretty psyched when Brian Bellendorf decided to come and work. But it's not when someone comes to the LF, it's when someone leaves. It's when someone leaves. You know, when Ian Murdoch, may he rest in peace, called me up and said, Jim, I just got offered my dream job at Sun Microsystem. He was our CTO. Huge pay increase. I, I, you know, as a kid, I just, everything about Sun and Solaris, I loved it. I'm gonna go take this job. I was proud of that. I wished him well. When Sam Ramji, is Sam here this morning? Somewhere around here? When Sam Ramji called me up and said, I just got offered a job as the VP of product for Google's compute platform. Big job. I was so proud of the fact that the guy who was running Cloud Foundry is now going to that job. And Neela Jacques, who's been running our Open Daylight project for three years, one of our earlier projects, uh, is now leaving the organization as well. He's going to Bain Capital, uh, to become an entrepreneur in residence there. And I'm so proud of the fact that he is going on to an opportunity where he is gonna go create new organizations and value at one of the best venture capital firms in the Valley. So if you could just stand up, Neela, and give Neela a thank you. <laughs> Don't worry, Open Daylight is in good hands. Phil Robb was doing all the work anyway, so. <laughs> so I do, I get applause on you. Uh, so Phil Robb will be the uh, interim executive director and uh, you need not worry about that project. Enjoy this week. We've got so much to accomplish, uh, not just this week, but in open source in general. The thing I always tell developers or people who are working in open source is not the biggest problem you'll have, the biggest challenge, is not that you think too small, it's that you don't think nearly big enough. If we can all work together, the great outcomes we've already have are only gonna get better. So have a great week, uh, and thank you for listening to me this morning.